All right, everyone, welcome to Mather Days. Let's go ahead and uh, get started on this exciting day. I'm going to start by sharing the slides, and I believe I have even um, made it so that future Mather Day events, you will have access to the slides through Eventbrite. So I'm still learning some of the technology also, but uh, I'll continue to ping your uh, chat box with this link as I see more people joining. So come on into the interactive link and welcome to Mather Days. My name is Teresa Wills. I'm an assistant professor at a George Mason University in the Math Education Leadership Department. Uh, and today you are in store for a math routine and a rich task. I try to showcase math routines as being short bursts that take about seven minutes in your class with a new one each week uh, just to get some variety. And then I always include a rich task, something that takes us a good 20 minutes to solve and a good 20 minutes to talk about. And I use Smith & Stein's five practices uh, for the rich tasks. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right in on slide one. I've got several ways you can stay in touch through email address, uh, website, Twitter handle, and uh, YouTube channel. So definitely check those out. And on slide two are where you can go for templates and previous recordings. On the templates uh, slide, you'll see I try to include just about every template I make. Um, and you can go in there, you can access the templates, you can also edit them to make them work for you. So you have full edit versions as well. And on the Mather Days link, you will see all the previous uh, Mather Days sessions that we've done, which includes a lot of different routines um, and the rich tasks that we did. And the rich tasks, I really try to um, ensure that they can um, be accessed by multiple grade levels. And today's rich task um, is uh, truly accessible from grades two through um, six. And then I've got even some extensions to get them all the way up to eighth grade. Uh, so we're gonna look at doing this task across many grade levels. I'm gonna ask you to share a little bit of yourself with us on either slide three, four, or five. Here's a link if you're just joining. Uh, tell us a success or a celebration. Uh, you can respond by photo text box, animated GIF or meme, you can do a Bitmoji in here, whatever you want to do to express the successes and celebrations in your life. And I'm going to add one as well. Let's see, will that add? No, that'll do that. My kids and I were playing this game called Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. If you've never played it before, I highly recommend it. You get these little ghosts that you can put on your fingers. Um, it's kind of a little bit like Clue, and it's a cooperative game. So you either all win or you all lose, and you really have to work together. I put that link in there. And uh, let's hear what some other folks are doing. Um, First of all, I'm so excited to see this fifth grade slide. Um, who is this? And, um, you know, this is so cool because I feel like the fifth graders can teach me a little something about these slides. I'm on um, slide five there. Um, who did this one? Um, that's Jerry. I'm from um, Seattle, Washington area. And, yeah, my fifth graders are loving it. We're doing the, the Google slide shares that I learned from, learned from you, and they are just taking off, loving it. It is so neat. I don't know how to do this like rainbow and the sunburst, but now that I know it can be done, I'm going to be spending my afternoon playing around with it, probably asking my third grader who loves technology to just show me how to do it. Um, very cool. Yes, awesome. Um, and let's see, Sheila, it seems like you're pretty excited about a raise. How are you doing? Thanks for your patience. Sorry, I'm not on my work computer. I forgot to get back into BBCU and turn the mic on. Um, yeah, I'm excited about arrays in Fairfax. Well, at, at least at my school, fifth grade, we're, we're um, 
testing on unit one, the characteristics of numbers on Friday, and I'm, I'm, um, I've, I've really been using everything I've learned from you in terms of the interactive slides, and the kids are really um, getting up to speed, but I'm, I'm just terrified that they're not going to be ready for this test. Um, so um, I'm excited that maybe this work with the raise today is going to help me help them. Yeah, so today it'll be a, a practical situation um, that they can then take and you can even, um, you know, spawn several more traditional math problems off of it um, because they have a context to go back to. Alrighty, um, who's our B person um, that you had bees in your house? I assume this was not part of a 2020 new hobby about beekeeping and collecting the honey though, is that right? This was not a hobby. It was not meant to be, but they took up residence between the two floors in our house on the outside wall. And we had a beekeeper come in and remove the bees to his place where he, they are very happy now. You know, my um, my late grandfather was a beekeeper. And um, so apparently if you ever see a swarm of bees, they are non-threatening. And like beekeepers will love it. If you give them a call, they'll come over with like this huge sack and just kind of like collect them all and then bring them back. Oh, it's great fun. <laughs> These were inside. He had to vacuum them, but he especially designed a vacuum to get them. That is pretty neat. All right, Allison, how is the bike ride uh, going? Oh, it was fun. Um, I got my daughter to go with me. I usually go running with my dog alone on Saturday mornings, but my daughter wanted to join, so she stuck with me for four miles, and we made a pit stop at Starbucks, so she was happy with her cake pop. Um, but it was fun. It was fun to get out. <laughs> Glad to see you here, Allison. And uh, Sally, I see some modifications. I can't wait to hear about them. I'm on slide five. And Sally, can you tell us a little bit about uh, these modifications you've made here? Sure. Um, our upper grade students are looking at fractions and ratios. So we use some of the pictures from the Fraction Talks website. And it's a little hard to see it over there on the right, but we had some of your slides where the kids have a speech bubble and they were filling in things that they spy. And our ESL teacher was helping one of our newcomers with things like colors and shapes. And some of our sixth graders were able to notice that there are two orange triangles that are equivalent to the yellow square. So we had a really wide range of responses and just a lot of success for all of our students, I think. That is so wonderful. I can't wait to see um, more of this. And um, if you, Sally, if you don't mind sharing um, your slide, feel free to send it to me and I'll pop that one up with the templates. I kind of believe in this to get uh, in it together thing um, and love to showcase some of your work. Just let me know how to cite it. Alrighty, and Laura, I'm loving the, uh, did you make a GIF out of this? How did you make it animate? Um, so I made, uh, good morning, I made an uh, interactive um, slide in Google Slides where it animates like each um, sentence of the problem solving oath animates it and then I just recorded it and turned it into a GIF. But it has been the highlight of our week. So cool. I'm so, I, I have no idea how to make GIFs, so I'm going to have to figure that one out. I love learning new things. Thank you everyone on a personal level here. Um, all right, let's uh, let's jump right in um, to our session today. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with our math routine. What comes next? Oops, this slide's in here from the past. I'm going to just move that down. Uh, our math routine is what comes next, and I'm on slide seven. If you've just joined us. Um, go ahead and click on that link, but we're on slide seven. And I'm going to ask you to grab one of those available text boxes and don't be shy about the animals. Sometimes I use a little visual cue so students know which box is theirs. And you're going to tell us not the answer to this question. Don't tell us what comes next, but what pattern do you notice? So you'll click in any available text box and tell us the pattern that you notice.
All right, now I'd love to hear from some of you. Um, if you noticed a pattern, go ahead and raise your hand. And at this point, I am actually looking to see all of my students raise their hands and I'll keep some observational notes if there's one or two that don't, just to make sure that I reach out to them. Um, but I'll show another technique for um, using all the tools at your disposal. So if you do see a pattern, go ahead in to collaborate and raise your hand. All right, I can see we have seven big thinkers right now and more to come. And uh, Joyce, let's start with you. Um, can you tell us the pattern that you are seeing? From two rows, two rows to four rows. Uh, Joyce, can you do it one more time for us? So you're cutting out just a little there. Does the pattern go from one row, two rows to, to four rows? Ah, so one row, to two rows to three rows to four rows. If your response on the slide um, was that, go ahead and change the box to yellow. So if your pattern that you noticed was also one row, two rows, three rows, four rows, change your text box to yellow. And if you changed it to yellow, you can lower your hand. We're gonna look for some different um, ideas that we had seen. And Dawn, can you share with us the pattern that you noticed? I noticed one group of three. And where did you see that? When I looked at the array, the array, they were all touching, so I, I called it a group. And which, um, which of these images was the one you're referring to? the first one so what it's really one so it looks like a row of three yeah so one group of three very cool if you saw this as a group go ahead and change the color of your text box to green and you can also lower your hand And if you have a different uh, pattern that you notice, keep that hand up. And let's hear from Allison. Hey, I um, was kind of noticing the, the either the shapes or the color. So I, um, the one that I typed in the box about the outlines of the shapes and how the colors change. So I noticed the first one's pink and then blue and then it looks like black and then yellow. So I'm wondering if the next one will be pink. Ooh, very cool. So is there some kind of pattern happening with color? If you brought color into this, change your box to a, a lovely blue color. All right, and we could continue to look at some different patterns that we notice. Um, one nice thing for getting students ready to talk about classification and categorization is uh, having them listen to a peer and then having to summarize their own response as being categorized similar to a peer. So that's one of the structures that are involved here. Um, and so now I'd like to hear from you all about what you think comes next. And um, I think maybe if everyone wants to go ahead and, and find a box and, uh, you know, design their next one, we'll take about a minute and there's room on slide eight or nine. Um, you can write in words what you think the fifth one will be or you can draw it out. And you're welcome to also use paper pencil. It doesn't need to be a, a virtual drawing. Yeah. 
If you use paper and pencil, I've put the directions for how you upload an image. And again, if you're just joining us, the link is in the chat box there, and we are drawing out what we think the fifth image will be, or you can write it in words. Now, one of the neat things that ties together some digital literacy with the ideas of multiplication is, um, did you know you can press the control D button? And what that does is it will duplicate whatever you've clicked. Now that's really important for kiddos as they are learning to multiply, because suppose they made five rows of clouds, like we've got one of them there, and then we duplicated the five rows to make many different columns. That's our idea of multiplication being you're, we're going to multiply this column many times. I see someone's doing that duplication with the hearts right now. And so we were able to see that same column repeated, which brings us into that idea of repeated addition. All right, other than the, um, the digital literacy where we're learning how to copy and paste images or write in text boxes, uh, what other math concepts do you see happening here on these slides? You're welcome to turn on your microphone and chat. You're also welcome to type in a the chat box there. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Ralph. Um, what you see? Um, not. I'm noticing that the some of the boxes are using the words rows and columns, and those, even though we don't think of it as math words, that that definitely helps our thinking and multiplication and repeated addition. Um, and then we can take those vocab words and connect it to some of the visuals. And there's a clear idea of what rows and columns or arrays might look like in multiplication or addition um, because everyone's kind of making um, groups of something. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so, you know, we, we can informally bring up these vocabulary terms also. I noticed that some people used images uh, that they drew with, you know, marker and paper. And I love showcasing that you can use a lot of low tech um, in this high tech environment. Um, and the person who made the red circles on slide eight, can you tell us what extra little challenge you had with that one? Who did the little red circles? When I selected the image and I pasted it in, it had it set up so it was three rows of five. So I then had to spin it so that I had to rearrange the array so that it appeared as though that were five rows of three. Neat. And if we're following, uh, you know, our guide that we had mentioned there, we would want to see five rows. 
not necessarily five columns, which brings us back to Raha's point about using that vocabulary. Fabulous. Um, one thing that I love about this routine is that you can make it so open um, and you can also, you know, invite kids to be creative with it. All right, folks, we are going to jump into our rich task today. And um, today I do have a co-presenter with us, Christina, um, who is going to be moving in and out of the different breakout rooms. And Christina is going to lead us in a session in a couple uh, Saturdays. So uh, you'll see her moving around as well. All right. So why do we do rich tasks? On slide 11, uh, I don't just say, hey, I think they're good. Uh, I want to relate it back to our research from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, the principles to action. These are the math teaching practices. And you'll see all of these today, everything from being very focused on a goal to uh, connecting different math representations using math discourse. During the math talk, I'll pose purposeful questions and try to make sure we're um, connecting that conceptual understanding with the struggle that you did in the task. And before we start, um, I would love to give you all an opportunity to make an oath for today. On slide 12 is our problem solving oath. I'll read it out loud, you read it to yourself, and if you pledge to um, do this today, you can type your name in the chat box. I, Teresa, promise to try my best. I will make sense of patterns and numbers. I will use manipulatives and drawings. I will make mistakes. I will ask questions. I will listen to other ideas. I will stay engaged by always trying to find another solution or representation. I am a problem solver. I make the world a better place. Look at all these great thinkers we have today. And today's task is all about gardening. I have a little video that I'll share here on the screen. Um, if you are having any kind of a weak connection, you're welcome to just click that link on slide 13 also. So here's our video. How to plan a square foot gardening layout. Square foot gardening uses boxed in beds to grow vegetables and other plants in square foot sections. Here are some tips for planting one. You will need graph paper, planting strategies, plants, and compost. Optional, wooden boards, and old tires. Step 1. Sketch the proposed garden bed on a piece of graph paper, labeling the compass directions and locating any surrounding landmarks. The boundaries of a square foot garden bed do not have to be square. Although the boundaries are usually wooden planks, they can be almost anything, even old tires. Step 2. Decide what you are going to grow and how much space you will need. For example, in a one foot square section, you could grow one cabbage, four lettuces, or 16 carrots. Space requirements may be found on seed packages or online. Step 3. Decide where you will plant. Oh no, were you not getting sound there? Sorry about that. Let's try it again. All right, here's the important part. And I'm gonna hit play. Just kidding. Planks, they can be almost anything, even old tires. Step two, decide what you are going to grow and how much space you will need. For example, in a one foot square section, you could grow one cabbage, four lettuces, or 16 carrots. Space requirements may be found on seed packages or online. Step three, decide where you will plant your vegetables in the bed. Keep in mind that taller plants should be placed on the north side of the bed so they do not shade shorter ones. Step four, complete your graph paper sketch and then build your garden. When harvest time comes, harvest a square foot, add compost, and replant your garden with a new and different crop. Did you know, a well-planned asparagus bed can last from 20 to 30 years. All right, so that's a little launch to get us into uh, our task. Um, and the reason that we need to know about that is because today is all about planting our garden. On slide 14, I have a visual that shows about how much space you would need for some of the plants that we're going to use. We have um, broccoli, cabbage, pepper, leaf lettuce, Swiss chard, 
marigolds, bush beans, spinach, beets, carrots, radishes, and onions. And each of those crops need a different amount of room um, and the visual is there. You're gonna create your own garden. There are slides below. So if you are in group one, you'll start on slide 15. We've got our group here and names. If you prefer to each plant your own garden, um, you can make as many duplicate slides as you want. Uh, so just make a new one if you wanna make your own. Sometimes people like to work together um, and problem solve some different ideas. Sometimes they like to make their own. Group two will start off on slide 16 and so on. On each of these slides, these images are drag and drop. So you just move them in. And when you're finished, you'll fill out how many broccolis do you have, peppers, Swiss chard, and more. We're going to come back together and our conversation will be richer than the activity itself, but I'm going to use the student evidence from the activity to lead us into the conversation. Alrighty, I'm going to create the breakout rooms automatically and then you will head into them, turn on your microphones, say hello to everybody in your group and go ahead and uh, start up. Alrighty, our breakout rooms are starting right now. Hi, Christina, feel free to move in and out. Um, some of the things and for listeners who are watching the recording that I'm looking for right now, um, I am looking for students who are participants who are making arrays. So I really wanna bring out, um, you know, if we had uh, lettuce, there's four of them that fit in a square. If they have three of those chunks, I'm looking for some kind of like, um, you know, do we count three times four? Or do we count two uh, times six and some different arrays that are popping out of it? So that's what I'm going to be looking for. And I'm going to be pasting those below slide 22 for our conversation. All right, cool. Sounds great. And if you see any, Christina, feel free to grab a screenshot of them and add them underneath that five practices slide. Okay, I will do. But I have a question for you. I only see four. Uh... Am I doing something wrong? On the left, I only see broccoli, let, uh, lettuce, or cabbage, whatever it is. Maybe it's Swiss chard, and then a pepper, and then a foursome. Am I, I missing? Had, I slid the bar at the bottom of my slide. Oh, yes. Yeah, I know, I've done that too. Oh, my gosh. Yes, very good. Okay, so is the whole idea here? Go ahead, and we'll put Gail. Oops. I have a hard time typing sideways. <laughs> I know. Gail, Allison. Yeah. All right. She's more interested in the math, that's my guess, but um, but they all seem pretty low, so I don't think it really might be too relevant. Is that spinach? Do I get any spinach? Yeah, I guess is that I think that's spinach. Do we have to have everything or can we just have what we want? I think it's our choice. Yeah. I think there was, yeah, I think there's many parameters. Just plant the garden. Can you, guys, can you guys tell what that one is um, below the flowers and above the spinach? All right, let's see. A uh, bush bean? I don't want bush beans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, I'm not good with carrots. I think those are radishes, garlic, onion. Oh, what is that? You got garlic, it's garlic, garlic. Well, that's, that's a, a good question. Oh, that's a, oh, let me go back. Let me look at 14. The big one is cabbage, and the four smaller ones are the leaf lettuce. Mm. Okay. They're definitely what we need, you know, on the south side, right? Because they're the smallest. Right. Do we need to put the carrots down below, too? I think carrots grow pretty tall, let's see. I don't know. Yeah. They do. They get that tall, like the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The leafy part. Mm -hmm. So do onion. 
And I think they organized it. Do you see that last row with the carrots? I think those are all the taller ones. Mm -hmm. I could know, but I think that's the way they've organized it. That column are all the taller vegetables. Oh, say that one more time. I could be totally wrong, but I know that onions grow really tall, and I know that carrots do also. So mm -hmm. I think that first column um, mm -hmm. with the carrots and the onions, I think those are all like the taller growing plants. And so I think that whole column, if we're going to use those, need to be on the north side. What about good distance learning? She was like, how do I get to the, the images? I was like, just scroll to the bottom. She's like, where's the gray scroll? I was like, okay, hold on. Let me put some arrows in and then you can. Interesting. I just really like square numbers, so <laughs> that, that stood out to me right away. Do you want the squares around the outer edges? Since our four corners are squares. Well, I think they're all square numbers. Are because they have, um, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. one, four, nine, and 16, if I counted correctly. Yep. Mm -hmm. They are. I wish we had a fourth little single plant yeah. rather than duplicating <laughs> a pepper well, or something. Like pets, pepper, lettuce, or broccoli. Want to do another pepper on that? That last one? I say pepper for more color. Yeah. No other mathematical reason. But, um, <laughs> do you want to put some spring onions on the top since we have root vegetables like the carrots up there? We could put some uh -huh. of the, um, to make some of the onions go near there. Okay. And um, you know what? I think oh, we I have one broccoli, don't we? Don't we have one broccoli? Uh Oh, we do. I'm so sorry. Okay, all right. Um, I think I figured that. I, I think I figured out the math part here. When we're yeah, finding we the photo, yeah. <laughs> we're. I was like, oh, this sounds so much fun. I'm gardening because I can never do it in real life. But I think I figured it out. Sixteen, sixteen, thirty-two onions. Like that. Okay. One, two, three, nine. Did everybody get a chance to count something? I had a chance. Yeah, I counted the carrots and the bush beans. Mm -hmm. Okay, 18, rad 18 radishes. Tell me if I'm right. Am I missing some? Yep, you're right. Nine, two, eighteen, yeah. Nice job. So we need to do B. Do we all do Wait, that? Wait, no, are, are radishes? I think we put in oh. beets. We didn't put in radishes. They look similar, but I think we yeah, put in. Yeah, go back to this slide. What was it? Fourteen. Let's see what we put in. I think it's yeah, zero radishes, beets. but eighteen. Beets. Yeah, the radishes are smaller. They're a four by four. Oh, okay. Uh, but they look very similar. They yeah, do, they, mm -hmm. they do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so somebody nine. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Hi there, Greg. Um, one... Hello. I am curious how you counted your carrots. <laughs> yeah. We were looking at that each section of carrots is four by four, so 16, and then we looked at 16 times three to give us 48. Oh, I see. So you saw three like grouping sections. Yes. Alrighty. And when you all, you can either do this now or when you're done adding them up, I want you to think of at least two other ways you could have um, figured out how many carrots are there. Think of other strategies. So 
Honestly, now that I think about it, the carrots, if we, because we did a corner, so we did three groups, but if we had had a fourth block, then we could have just figured out the whole length by width matrix and then just subtracted a group of 16. That's another way it could be done. Oh, that's interesting. Looking at it, if it, there was one where the lettuce is, you mean, or the cat. Yes, exactly. Now that Teresa said that, I'm like, yep, I mean, it could have done like four, like four groups of six, like all the way across. So it would be eight by eight. Yes, eight by eight, mm -hmm. and then take away a group of 16. Mm -hmm. Or we can do the top two, eight, uh, four by eight, and then the four by four underneath it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Hi, group. Um, Claudia is joining you. Uh, Claudia, welcome. Uh, you are in uh, group five, and I just posted the link onto your, uh, your chat. Okay, thank you. Dream job. I'm sorry? That, that would be my dream job. <laughs> oh, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, I'd love to. I did do that once, and then I became a principal, and I'd love to go back to just now. I went and got my administration license and everything, and they had pushed and pushed, and I was like, mm. So I teach Fairfax, <laughs> and Fairfax made a lot of promises in Virginia. <laughs> so. Oh, the beeps? Is that? I only thing is when you highlighted it, I couldn't see your highlighting. I'll move it over to the side by the compass, the one I'm talking about. Okay, right. That. Oh, yeah. That radishes. Yeah. You're right. These are beets. Yeah. So I'm gonna take away one of the beets. Okay. And insert the radish. I think I just changed the numbers in the table to match that for the correct number of radishes and beets. Could someone check that for me to make sure I did that correctly? You did, and it was just really confusing for me to figure out which one was the radish and which one was the beet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they start to look alike when they're smaller. Yeah. I think we got it, though. Hi, Christina, and anyone else listening to the recording, on slide 23 and 24, I have several images for us to discuss. They bring up lovely little arrays, um, but they also bring up um, really nice questions about how you subdivide uh, numbers. So on slide 23, we have the yellow, blue, and black array, which are pretty standard arrays. The purple one, though, is interesting because it has the onions spread out into two places. So I want to discuss what happens when our array is not together. And then on slide 24, um, the orange area, we might look at um, subdividing, starting off with our whole orange and then taking off a quarter of it. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that uh, we can talk about that, how to find the total number of carrots. And uh, finally, on slide 24, I want us to talk about symmetry and how we can use symmetry to quickly calculate um, number of vegetables in the garden. All right, so I'm going to bring everyone on back now. Oh, oh sorry. Well, I'm back to the main room, everyone. We are all back together. Can you believe we have been planting virtually for 20 minutes and we are ready for our whole group conversation? As mentioned in those math teaching practices, those were the things up on slide 11. Um, one of them is eliciting and using evidence of student thinking. Um, this is the, uh, the foundation of a math talk. And so I gathered some student thinking on slides 23 and 24. And these are going to lead our discussion today. And 
and um, I'll start off with, um, you know, we'll, we'll start in the kind of idea of array, and then we'll move up quickly into some um, other thinking and then stretch this even further to middle school and beyond. Um, so if you um, can see uh, a nice way of calculating the number of marigolds on side 23, you can turn on your mic and tell us, you can type it in the chat box, but have a voice in one of those ways. How would you figure out how many marigolds are here? Go ahead, Laura. Hey, so we were looking at marigolds and initially we saw them as three individual groups of four. So and a, a two by two makes a group of four and then three separate groups of four. But another way we were thinking is you could go two across and six down. And that way you could determine that there were 12 marigolds. Neat. So we have uh, three groups of four. I want to make sure that I get your voice. So three groups of four. And um, you mentioned a six and a two, and I want to get your words right. What, what were you saying about the six and the two? Um, that you could go two across. Like, so if you are looking at it two horizontally and six vertically, six down. So then you could either look at it as six groups of two or two groups of six, and that would also give you 12 marigolds. Wonderful. Um, and I see some other ways here in the chat box. We are going to zoom past the first couple because I definitely want to get our conversation into the others, um, but I want to be explicit since I'm working with a group of teachers. Um, so uh, let's see, let's check out the black outlines. How would we figure out how many bush beans are in the black outlined image? Make your voice heard either in the chat or over the mic. Four groups of nine, yeah. All right, we had four groups of nine. Um, and where do we see those four groups? I it's that perfect square of nine in one group, sorry. Okay, so we have like this here being our group. Sally, you see two groups of 18. Um, how do you how do you visualize that 18? I was thinking about the nine and knowing that if I double nine, it would be 18. So half of the rectangle is 18. And then the other half on the other side would also be another 18. Neat. Uh, Laura, you have three times 12. How do you visualize that one? Um, so I was looking at, if I'm looking at it uh, horizontally, all the way across, it's 12 bush beans, uh, but the 12, one row of 12 is stacked three times, so three groups of 12. All right, so we have this kind of long top bit. And Lydia even mentions, um, so earlier when somebody was mentioning this red square, Lydia breaks it down into not only is it four times nine, but it's actually four times three times three. And so we can talk about, you know, our, um, our factors in that way. All right, so now that we have some kind of basic ways of bringing up multiplication and grouping, how do we do, use that to solve the situation in the purple outline? We have some onions up here, and we have some onions down here. They are not connected. So how can we use the strategies that we mentioned before with arrays to figure out how many onions are here in total? When we were calculating ours in our group, um, we took, we found a total in one square and we either doubled it or tripled it into how many ever we had. For example, for the onion, it's four, 
sorry, I didn't count all of them. <laughs> 16, so then we doubled 16, so we got 32. Okay, and then you doubled it. And when you say double, um, you know, if we're working in this idea of multiplication, we sometimes use the word double, triple, quadruple, and then we like run out of words. Maybe some of y'all happen to know more. That's as many as I know. Um, so what is another way of um, being able to explain what doubling is? Multiplying by two. Okay. So we could also say... All righty. Or adding another set, ah. like adding the same again. So we can get into some great repeated addition here as well. Uh, but here's where I really wanted to get to. This is kind of the um, where the, the session is going to. This might happen near the end of your unit, but uh, on slide 24, we're going to look at the orange outline first. What are some different ways we could count the number of carrots? Ah, Sheila mentioned three fourths of the plot. Um, so that is where we are getting into. We've got this idea of fractional amounts. Sheila, could you tell us um, what your definition of a plot is and how you see three fourths? So the plot is the total area I have to plant, and I see that you know three quarters of that plot of that area is devoted to carrots. And how large is your plot? Did you already say that? Maybe I was typing when you were speaking. I didn't, no, because I'm not a number person. It's. Uh, it looks like it's, well, in terms of carrots, it's 8 by 8, right? Two, four, yeah, it's 8 by 8. I like the units that we're using here. Uh, Lara, uh, tell us about your uh, your uh, chat that you just typed in. Um, so we were group we were our group was looking at um, very similar to what Sheila was saying about the whole and then taking away a quarter of it. Um, and we tried to capture it on slide nineteen where we showed that the, if we take away the cabbage, if we imagine that there is another group of four, like there are four sets of cabbages, and so then we would do eight by eight and then just take away a group of 16. So that idea that you're taking away a piece of it if you calculate the whole matrix. It sounds like you are using um, our earlier idea um, that Sheila mentioned. So you're finding the eight by eight and then you're minusing Am I writing this how you thought? Yep, exactly. That we are taking, that we're removing a piece from the whole. That we're looking at eight across, eight down, and taking away sixteen from it. Or taking a piece away from all of it. I really like the uh, discussion of units here, um, because we can call a plot four squares. We can call uh, it an eight by eight carats large. We can talk about it being 16 and also one piece. Uh, Allison, you're bringing up another visual. You're talking about uh, three fourths of 64 equals 48. Tell us how you're visualizing this. So I just um, was considering how this could be really powerful visual for students if they're multiplying fractions and recognizing the whole, um, like using the cabbage to recognize the whole. So there's three quarters or three fourths or that are carrots, but then switching that over and looking at it in the units that the carrots are in. So um, you're now looking at the whole as 64. So you can clearly see that three fourths of 64 is 48. So then we can start defining our, our whole. Is our whole 64 or is our whole four? And having these fantastic conversations. Um, 
There is one more that I wanted to take a look at in the green outline. And my question to you is, how can you use symmetry to determine how many vegetables are in the whole entire garden? Think about that and go ahead and put your response in the chat. Give everyone some think time. How could you figure out how many vegetables are in the whole entire garden? I'm seeing a lot of uh, this idea of doubling. And Dara, I'm curious, where did you see the half that you then wanted to double? I'll make an arrow for you if you want to use that to show us. Where did you see our half? Yeah, no problem, Dara. Um, Lisa's mentioning a vertical line being drawn straight down here. Is that the only place we could see one half? And Joyce, where do you see quarters? Because I was um, and then and then third that last section has one. Okay, so the left side of the third is very similar, and then the center is different, and you could actually do that. Oh, neat! All right, I'm gonna bring some of our transparent pieces over here. Um, so we've got sections like clusters that have, um, you know, different chunks in them. Um, some other people mentioned quarters up there. That's one of the things that I thought of, first of all, is quarters. And while it doesn't make a lot of sense in some ways, um, for me, in my mind, I'm able to kind of mathematize that to make some sense here. All right, folks, um, I did want to bring this up and down to different grade levels. Um, and so um, as kind of follow up questions where you could bring this is, um, first of all, how did you count your veggies? Um, but also, what are the total uh, number of plants you have making charts? I saw somebody mention that. What's the most amount of plants you could plant? How about the least amount? If you are teaching middle school, um, did you know that different plants come in different amounts of seeds per packaging? Uh, so, for example, uh, if you're planting beans, you might get about 12 to uh, 20 beans per seed package. But if you plant uh, carrots, you often get about 100 seeds in a seed packet. And so you can get into conversations about how many seed packets would you need to order. And typically, um, seed packets, if they have been sitting around for a long time, they don't always grow. And so if you bring up the concept that, you know, let's say 20% of them do not grow, how many do you need to get? Um, and we can continue taking this up and down into different grade levels. If you see other applications of this, feel free to type those in the chat box there. Um, and I did want to also mention on um, slide 28 that I'll have these templates up and the Mather Days up. I've got several frequently asked questions on slide 29. 
a sneak peek of my book that is coming out uh, in about a month and a half. And I'm going to take any um, questions you all have in the virtual parking lot. Uh, but as people are rolling down there, I wanted to hear from Allison. How did you see ratios in this um, this topic today? Oh, I was just I was thinking a lot of like sixth grade and up, like where you're like how this could work for that. Because I know you had said this was intended more for like second through sixth, but I can definitely see this scaling up where you're comparing different um, of different plants to each other and finding like the ratio of one to the other, or even like tying in percentages um, and asking students to look at other gardens and figure out, you know, ask them questions about those. So I think there's a lot of practicality in this. And I think it would be really fun for students to do. So thanks. Absolutely. And Lisa, could you tell us about proportions? How are you seeing this extending up into proportional reasoning? When I looked back on slide 24 and we have three-fourths of 64 is 48, we could extend that three-fourths out of is how many out of eight or continue with whatever. So I see that a lot. And I also see when you mentioned how do we count, I'm the one that talked about the vertical line of symmetry. So that would probably be something with the eighth graders when they got that picture on slide 24, they can look for some symmetry there. Wonderful. And Jerry, how about percentages? Yeah, when, when somebody mentioned taking it to decimals, my brain first thought of uh, percentages. So what percentage of your garden is each vegetable? That would be really fun. Absolutely. And Christina, how about fractions, decimal, percent equivalencies? So, yeah, so we, last year I did this, and we're actually coming into it uh, this year really soon. So we'll be doing it again similarly so the kids actually did plant their own garden and our school has like a huge garden so like they're all really into like the gardening theme anyway and um so they had to make some decisions about how they would like organize their garden but then they had to determine well what now what fraction of your garden is actually tomatoes and what and then we talked about the percent that it was and so they had to find those equivalencies um so it was a really it was a really fun. It was really fun, and they really got a lot out of it. And it was interesting because some of them did really focus on that like um, symmetry of their garden, where other kids were just like, "I'm putting tomatoes here, and I'm putting lettuce there," and it was like all over the place. And then when they had to like try and actually figure it out, it was like, "Oh wait, theirs was a lot easier to figure out than mine was." So that was really fun for them to figure out, see too. Yes. And, you know, when we're talking about fractional amounts, we could say, you know, what um, what percentage of the area is carrots or we could say what percentage of total crops are, ca are carrots. And we're going to get very different answers when we're focusing on area um, or we're focusing on actual crops. And so it kind of brings into the importance of using the units that you're uh, referencing. All right, there's a couple questions here in the virtual parking lot. I'm gonna answer those. Um, I know some people are heading out, so happy Mather Days. I hope you had a wonderful day today. I'm gonna post these up soon. And thanks for joining me um, as we create more uh, practical problems that teachers can go and use right away in their classrooms. Um, somebody asked, how would you do this in Zoom? Zoom now uh, has the, Zoom has the features of breakout rooms, much like Collaborate. Um, and so the only difference is um, for me, um, I can invite uh, random people into this Collaborate session, um, but it works basically the exact same in Zoom, um, just depending on what you have access to. Um, how do you create virtual game boards when you need a 10-sided dice? Uh, does YouTube not have a 10-sided die? Hey, Teresa. Um, if you find one, would you be willing to share? Because <laughs> I spent a lot of time looking um, for one that's comparable to the six-sided die rule and the double six-sided dice rule. Because um, we were adapting a couple games this week, and we kind of hit a wall with that. <laughs> Oh, I'll definitely have to look or make them. Um, so my nerdiness is going to come out in a minute here. But um, if you're looking for multiple types of dice, the Dungeons and Dragons crew call them like D10 um, or yeah, D20. Yeah, or D12 mm -hmm. or D20. Yeah, exactly. And I just couldn't. I wonder, like, if you find one, please share because we'd love it. Thank you. Yeah, let me see if I can get one of those. 
and then modify them. Yeah, let me see what I can do on this. Oh, it looks like Jerry may have found. Oh, yeah, so Google, by the way, if you want to use this one, they have a nice little um, uh, applet here, which lets you roll several. Um, Yeah, but I'll have to think about that one. I don't know of any off the top of my head. I just kind of expected them to be there. Now I'm going to be searching. All right, folks. Well, um, happy Mather Days. Um, I can't wait to hear the ways that you all uh, implement this. And um, if you have any other suggestions, definitely bring them out. Oh, Gail's got the toy theater ones. Ooh, I, I think we that. will. We were kind of hoping like a video would be mm -hmm. nice so that we can embed it in the slides. Have, but anything would do it now. <laughs> have the embedded videos been working out well for you all? Um, like how do you deal with the uh, clunkiness between um, one student being able to see the video and not both? So to Raha and I this week, we um, tried to recreate. So you have the make it, say it, compare it game. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I kind of pushed it up to like the thousands um, and the hundreds. Um, to kind of modify a game called Top It. I'm sure everyone's familiar where you try oh, yeah. to make the biggest number. Um, but the, and we did run across that with the kids where like some kids were saying like, oh, you cheated, you put a six in the place. I can't see your screen. But Ron and I were talking about how we actually don't mind if they did that because that shows us they under, if you can cheat at a game, then you know, understand place value. <laughs> uh, so we kind of told the kids like, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, um, you know what, if I don't see one, I will probably try and uh, create a video because I think we need that. Um. Yeah, that would be awesome. I was actually thinking about the other question as like, how do you make, and I was going to like email, uh, text one of my friends who is like a computer person and be like, can you make a video of a dice rolling from zero through nine? Because I need it. Um, if you follow um, Keller, what's her first name? Uh, Alice Keller, um, she's writing scripts that can be included in the slides. Um, some of the things about scripts is I'm not sure if different school firewalls are allowing students to use those, which is why I haven't yet. Um, but if you want to be, you know, try some things out, definitely check that out. Um, so you mentioned um, is every week different. Each week is different. It's a different routine and a different task. Um, so today's routine was um, what comes next and the task was the arrays. Uh, and I try to switch it up so that we get some secondary ones and some elementary ones in. Um, but again, going at the heart of it that with a good task, you can do some simple modifications to make it work for a variety of grade levels. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things I try and showcase. Teresa, I put a link in the chat box for the die. If um, I think it'll work for her, you can modify the die to be 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, or 20 sides. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that we are... Um, uh, are mentioning is there's there's virtual manipulatives that work really really well like this. Um, did you know that you can also embed a video into your slide uh, that lets you roll? So for example, if I insert a video and I put dice roll, let's see if I can find that one. Here we go. So this is now embedded, which means if the kids are playing the game, they can stay right here on the slide and just hit pause. And all of a sudden we've got our role right there. Thank you. I'm gonna ask, can you do that? I'm so sorry, can you 
do that one more time as I'm giving a virtual manipulatives PD on Wednesday? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let me let me delete this one and bring a new one back. All right. I'm going to go to insert and do video. And I'm just going to type in. So I might even do random number generator. It's another one that comes up. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I like this one. So I'm just kind of looking through YouTube videos here. And then it inserts. And then so I can hit play. And then whenever I'm ready, hit pause. And I get a random number. So really, you're just kind of pausing the video. Um, but it's a nice way of getting something fairly random. Thank you. Um, Veronica, when you are embedding videos within the Google Slides, um, I have not seen it for the random number generator and the dice. I would definitely check it out yourself first. Um, but when you embed them within Google Slides, so things are a little different. They, I don't, I haven't seen as many ads. Um, so hopefully that's just a sweet deal that Google's got going on. All right, folks, happy Saturday.